Welcome back to the Florida Linguistics Association Beginner's Guide to Phonetics. I'm Lee Ballard, a phonologist at the Florida Linguistics Association. We're going to continue to go through English phonetics today and give you more information to help you understand consonants, as well as do better on phonology problems and review for your exams. This Florida Linguistics Association intro guide is a multi-part mini-survey course. Last time we talked about vowels. I gave you examples of the most important and least controversial vowels in English, how they vary from each other, and I showed you the phonetic symbols from the IPA used to represent them. And to make matters worse, I introduced you to my friend Crazy Steve, who was crazy enough to allow me to make x-ray pictures of his speech organs. Today we'll talk about consonants. I'll give you examples of each in English, how they vary from each other, and show you the phonetic symbols from the International Phonetic Alphabet, or the IPA, used to represent them. In part four of the series, we'll finally conclude with some fun facts from the phonetics of other languages. In case you forgot, here's my friend Crazy Steve. Take a moment now to re-familiarize yourself with this diagram, in case it's been a little bit of time since you watched the last video or looked at your phonetics book. One of the main differences in phonetics is the difference between vowels and consonants. It's not always a clear dividing line, as there are sometimes sounds in languages, like L, R, and N in English, that can have vowel-like functions. But in general, vowels carry the melody of language. Consonants, on the other hand, are mostly noise. Vowels are created by resonating air in a larger or smaller area. The size of this area is determined by where the tongue is. The smaller the resonation area, the higher the pitch, and the larger the area, the lower the pitch, which is logical when you think that a piccolo plays higher than a tuba. Consonants are classified by a degree of obstruction and where that main obstruction occurs. To finish this review, let's take a minute to look at the whole vowel chart. As I said last time, this chart only shows most of the vowels in English, and to be completely honest, only those from one variety of American English. Remember as we move along that when we talk about a sound being alveolar, voiced, or velarized, we really are just describing with fancy jargon what crazy Steve's speech organs are up to when he has to pronounce the consonant while being x-rayed for eight dollars an hour. The obstructions that are responsible for consonants can be classified according to two parameters. First, the location of the obstruction, for instance, the lips or the alveolar ridge. Second, the type or degree of obstruction. Is the air completely stopped, or does some pass through? Do any articulators move during the production of the consonant, or do they basically hold steady? Find the lips and the alveolar ridge on this picture. Okay, now we'll look at three example words. The words are he, key, and batman. If we take the first vowel we looked at, the one in beat, we can also pronounce the word he with the same vowel. This H sound is called a glottal fricative. A fricative means the air passes through and is not completely stopped. Glottal means that H is pronounced at the glottis and not, say, with the lips. But there's also a glottal stop in English like in uh-oh or batman. But H is more common in English and it's a glottal fricative. Let's continue with our example word he and pronounce key. The consonant represented by the letter K is a velar stop. The air is completely obstructed at the velum and then the tension releases into the front high vowel E to get key. It's hard to see in the picture of Crazy Steve but the air is passing through the glottis somewhat while he's saying he. Now here's a picture of Steve when he said key. For key, Steve's tongue created a complete stoppage of air at the velum. That's why the sound K is called a velar stop. English K also happens, like the H English glottal fricative sound, to be unvoiced. But we'll get to this a little later. Here's the second consonant in the word Batman a complete stoppage of air all the way down at the glottis. Now let's look at another example with three more words, T, C, and V. 
For T, there is a complete stoppage of air at the alveolar ridge. English speakers pronounce T at the beginning of a syllable as an alveolar stop. But as we saw before, T at the end of a syllable is often much closer to a glottal stop. The reason why a glottal stop and an alveolar stop should be grouped together like this is particular to English and is part of the phonology of the language. In any case, the T-like consonant in Batman is a glottal stop and the consonant in T is an alveolar stop. Now let's look at the word C. The consonant in C is very similar to the consonant in T, but more air passes through. The only difference between these consonants, which are both pronounced at the alveolar ridge, is that the one in C is an alveolar fricative and the one in T is an alveolar stop. Steve's a real fan of the King James Bible. Let's have a look at him saying the. With the, there is a stoppage of air when the tongue goes between the teeth. It is not a stop, but a fricative since some air passes through. We'll get to this later, but unlike the consonants in C and T, which are unvoiced, the consonant in the, an interdental fricative, is voiced. Now let's look at another example with three more words, fi, bi, and we. For fi, there is a partial obstruction, but this obstruction is different in that two articulators are equally involved, the lower lip and the teeth. This kind of sound is called labiodental, and the English f sound is a labiodental fricative. Now let's look at the word b. The consonant in b is simpler than the consonant in fi, because only one articulator is involved, the lips. Furthermore, the English B sound is a stop, a bilabial stop, in fact. Let's have a look at Crazy Steve saying we now. With we, the consonant is similar to phi in that there are two articulators involved, but they do not share equal parts of the same role. To pronounce we, Crazy Steve's lips move some, and this forms the main part of the sound. Sounds that are produced by moving articulators are called glides. But English w is not just a bilabial glide. The tongue also raises towards the velum. So although most introphonetics textbooks just call w a bilabial, technically it is labiovelar. Let's recap all the consonants so far. At glottal place of articulation, we've got h as a voiceless glottal fricative, and the consonant in uh-oh, a glottal stop. K is a voiceless velar stop. T is a voiceless alveolar stop. S is a voiceless alveolar fricative. And th, one of the interdental fricatives, since air moves between the teeth. The last consonant in the word teeth, in fact, is the voiceless version of the same consonant in V. Now to sounds pronounced with the lips. F is a voiceless labiodental fricative. W a voiced by labial glide, and b, a voiced by labial stop. We can draw this on a graph. Each symbol now appears in a column showing where it is pronounced. This is place of articulation. Let's expand this out to differentiate between stops, fricatives, and glides, the three manners of articulation we've talked about so far. Although the words on the slides are becoming more technical, the consonants are definitely looking less crowded than at the beginning. Now let's replace the words at the top of the chart, which describe the articulators, with technical terms for different places of articulation. Places across the top, manners down the side. If you're still with us, we've arrived at a version of the consonant chart that is accepted as standard within linguistics. If this is still confusing, we're only about halfway done so go back and watch this first part again if I've lost you. If you're so far so good, then onward onto more complex phenomena. We'll talk about voicing next. Here's Crazy Steve pronouncing fee. What about V as in the Mighty Ducks flying V? The only difference between fee and V is that for V, the vocal cords vibrate and make a humming sound called voicing. You can feel this by touching your or someone else's Adam's apple and feeling difference between f and v. Try it! Pretty cool, huh? Ditto for t and d. To is voiceless. Do is voiced. In a very similar manner, 
the consonant in ki has no voicing, but gi has it. Let's find a way to add in voicing to the chart. Right now it's kind of a hodgepodge. For those consonants with a voicing distinction, we'll put the voiceless one on the left and the voice one on the right. Here goes. In case you're wondering, w is voiced, h is voiceless, and uh is such an unusual consonant that it's not even really defined for voicing. If someone pressed me, I suppose I'd guess it was voiceless. I don't know. In any case, got a couple more to add before we relax for the day. Here we go. Everything has fit rather neatly so far. Now we'll talk about some things that are kind of in-betweeners, post-alveolar sounds. These sometimes go by other names, but the vagueness of post-alveolar helps you avoid taking a side. One thing's for sure, and that's that both of the two sounds shown below are fricatives. Cheap and jeep are composed of a stop followed very quickly by a fricative. This combination of stop plus fricative of identical voicing at the same or very close place of articulation is called an affricate. You may have heard of diphthongs, which is when vowels combine together. The consonant version of that is affricates. Ship and cheap are voiceless, while azure and jeep are voiced. There are a lot of misunderstandings about nasal sounds. First of all, they don't really form a separate class by themselves. Nasals are best understood as nasal stops. Let me say that again and save you a lot of trouble. All nasals are voiced nasal stops. They correspond with sounds like these, which are the non-nasal counterparts at the same place of articulation. So what does that do to non-nasal sounds then? Good question! Answer, they're also known as oral sounds. Fricatives and affricates and stuff are usually oral too, just so you know. It's not just stops. Here's Steve pronouncing the voiced bilabial oral stop in B. What happened when he said me? Answer, the velum dropped down and made the sound nasal. This is what makes it possible to hold the sound, mm, whereas hold b, I dare you, I double dare you. I guess you're taking the physical challenge, sucker. Here we're speeding toward the end with only four consonants left to go. One of them you already know, the glide w as in wide. The other glide is y as in young. You can see the full words transcribed here in IPA. The two final sounds are unusual ones, the first much more so than the second. The English R sound gives English speakers such a bad reputation. I guess that's fair since it's a voiced alveolar approximate. The sound L as in light is a voiced lateral liquid, but it is pretty common among languages of the world, much more so than American R. Now in the words right and light, which I'm going to transcribe in several ways, the vowels are controversial. The three versions of right in the IPA are right, right, and right. To my ears, the last one is the best. I definitely hear the last consonant as the same one in uh-oh or Batman, and the vowel as the same one in but, plus the glide y. Yeah. What about you? Is light number one, number two, or number three? Number one, light. Number two, light. Number three, light. Write your answer in the comments. That was number two, by the way. Summary time. We've talked about consonants today. They've got places of articulation, like velar, alveolar, and glottal, as well as manners, like stops, fricatives, and liquids. Voicing is very important. Consonants can also share vowel features, not just when they're voiced, but also when they're nasalized or rounded, for instance. Finally, I showed you a couple of examples of controversial transcriptions. The controversies involved are those between different dialects of English, as well as between broad and narrow transcriptions. In this video series, we're learning the broad, most basic transcriptions. That's why it's even more important to learn all this material. Even though it seems like a lot, and it is if you're seeing it for the first couple of times. There's a lot more information out there. You really will help yourself to be successful at phonology problems by knowing this stuff cold. Anyway, when linguists describe a consonant, they usually say something like voiceless velar stop or voiceless alveolar 
oral fricative if they include nasal versus oral. Here's the order you should follow when describing consonants. If you want to include other features, like for the first consonant in ship, which has some lip rounding, you would be safe to say something like, it is a voiceless, postalveolar, oral fricative with lip rounding. So, here's the chart. The top row is meaningful as far as corresponds to frontness backness in Crazy Steve's mouth, that is, the teeth are in front of the alveolar ridge, which is in front of the palate, etc. As far as up-down, though, this is not really meaningful, as a stop is not any higher in any way than, say, a fricative. I'll pronounce the chart going from the top left, pronouncing one column at a time, where relevant, voiceless, followed by voiced. P, B, M, W, F, V, F, V, T, D, N, S, Z, R, Sh, Z, Ch, J, Y, L, K, G, N, A, H. And for good measure, don't forget the vowel chart. I'll start at the top left, go to the center, and then end up at the top right. E, I, E, U, E, A, A. A, O, O, U, U. This is the end of part three. Thanks for watching and I hope you enjoyed it. Don't forget to check out part 4 as well as other videos on our channel and of course our website www.floridalinguistics.com This has been Lee Ballard for the Florida Linguistics Association and hope to see you again soon.